everybody. Coming to you live from Beijing, China. It's early in the morning. I'm pretty jet lagged, pretty tired. I wanted to show you guys what it's like to run in Asia. What it's like to run with pollution in Asia because it's been like 200. It's been like 200 p.m. 2.5 the last few days, which is, which is up there. But first, I should probably get dressed. Oh my God, what is that? Is that the actually the sun? Might be the first time I've seen it in the whole week that I've been here. Might be the first time many Beijingers have seen the sun. I'm just kidding. I've got these bags under my eyes because I'm still jet lagged. <laughs> shorts my pants i don't know what all this wind is about but it's freaking me out this might be a short-lived youtube video all right so what's the deal dude what are you doing in beijing i'm here for work it's not my first time in beijing i actually lived here a few years ago taking an intensive chinese course I was here for about two months then and only a week this time a long time ago i lived in Beijing and then so it's not my first time in China, so therefore I know the deal. And if you live in China, you know what I'm talking about. But I wanted to talk about the, the pollution because, I mean, if anyone who's out there is like scared of living in a city or doesn't want to live in a city because of the pollution, and you're from a Western country, well, let me tell you, the pollution in some parts of Southeast Asia is like, I mean, it's, it's like the reason they've been in pollution charts almost. And so like the last week, it's been like 200, 200 PM 2.5 pictures. It looks bad and it, it smells bad and there are actual physical effects. You know, but I, I mean, I've run all the way through the times I've been in, in Asia, you know, and here's how I kind of made it work. If there was like a workout I was gonna do, I would kind of like wait until the, the pollution would, would be good. And you know, you go in the morning as it is now. This is also a Sunday morning, so there's there's no cars running or as many as many cars running early in the morning. No trucks, less trucks. You know, like everyone isn't kind of woken up to start to like do all their stuff. And so like the pollution hasn't really started yet. So you, you might even find even if there's no wind on a day, you wake up early in the morning and the pollution pollution's lower than it will be later in the day, which kind of makes sense, right? And I think it's like that with pretty much any major city as well. Dallas was the same when I used to live in Texas. Um, you go running in the morning and there's just less pollution in the morning because there's been less people for the last six hours or so, right? That's one way. And the second way I was just kind of hinting at was basically we're doing it all at the right time. Basically, you kind of have to roll with the weather. So the reason today in Beijing, it's actually super, like this is crystal clear. And I think the pollution's only like 60 right now. The reason it's crystal clear is because of this, this crazy wind that you just saw me kind of run through. The way it'll work is, well, typically like in Asia, like in winter, it, the pollution gets the worst because the heat is on. So, and a lot of the, a lot of the heat, it can be coal powered. Obviously everyone's really cold up, especially up in Northern, Northern China, so that's where Beijing is. Um, everyone gets freezing and so they turn on the heat and so there's more pollution because there's more and more coal, coal plants running. Uh, what the wind systems will do is just kind of like, push it away somewhere else. So beyond like doing your runs in the morning, I mean, if you're gonna have like a workout, let's say, because a workout's relatively important in a, in a run person's career. What I would do sometimes is I would try to, you can kind of see, hopefully like when the pollution is going to be good. And they, the weather people will calculate it based off the wind currents, I'm assuming. And so like, okay, you know, Tuesday is supposed to be good pollution or supposed to be less pollution. I'm gonna try to schedule my workout then. So that you're not kind of exposing yourself to these harmful pollutants uh, when your 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 respiratory rate's at its highest, you're, you're getting more, you're breathing more. 
That's one thing I would do, Wendy. You know, and these pollutants, so people say like, well, what is, you know, and they say the pollution and they have like a number, like what does that mean? Typically they're referencing when they say the pollution is high, the one that everyone kind of like takes a gander at, uh, it's, it's PM 2.5. What that means is that there's suspended particulates in the air, 2.5 microns or smaller. What that really means, pedestrian walkway. Welcome to China. What that really means, because the particulates are so small, when you breathe them in, they go into your bloodstream because the way that your the way that your breathing works is you have like your in your lung, you have like the long sacs called the alveoli. They're like think like grape sacs. And the skin of the alveoli, like the skin of a grape, it's so thin. That's what allows the transfer of oxygen from the air to breathe into the blood. On the outside, you have like the skin. The skin's so small, oxygen can transfer through into the blood. It's like, it's, 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 it's the smallest thing in the world. And that's basically how we live. So when you breathe in the pollution, the particulates are also very small, I think much like oxygen, right? I don't know the exact comparison, but that will also go into the bloodstream. And these are particulates from things like, like, like car exhaust, bus exhaust, coal factories like the burning of coal the, the stuff that goes into the air among other things so that the health implications of this are the health implications are not good pm 2.5 positively correlated with an increase in respiratory tract disease for people with children pm 2.5 was significantly associated with cough wheezing and low respiratory infection even more so than adults, possibly due to the, the immature respiratory system, not fully developed respiratory system of the child. A 10 microgram increase in PM 2.5 was associated with a 0.4% increase in non-accident mortality, a 0.63% increase in mortality due to cardiovascular disease, and a 0.75 increase in mortality due to respiratory disease. Effects on blood pressure. Mm. For every 10 microgram increase in PM 2.5, a 1.393 milliliters of mercury, or like the, the pressure they use to measure blood pressure, increase in systolic, and a 0 0.895 mmHg uh, milliliters of mercury increase in diastolic. So basically, your blood pressure gets higher. So there's been like many linked long-term effects, but they haven't been 100% fully proven yet possibly due to just the the immaturity of the length of the studies for all this stuff right it just hasn't really the research only started so many years ago but basically the strong links that haven't been proven yet are cardiovascular disease mortality and cancer also just so everybody knows pm 2.5 was designated as a group one carcinogen by the world health organization and so living in an environment like this being exposed to pollution levels like this exercising aerobically in an environment like this probably isn't the most healthy thing to do and so you really have to be kind of careful about it you know full transparency most of my time in asia was spent in taipei which had pollution but like the worst it would get would be 130 150 the worst like a handful of times out of the year most of the time it was around like 60 or 70, 30, 40, something like that. It would... It's a sign telling people not to swim, but do Tai Chi. This guy's following the instructions. So running in Taipei was, was bad by Western standards, but not too bad by, by Beijing standards. There's some parts, I mean, like, look at parts of India. Oh my God. You know, how do you do this? How do, how do you stay a runner in a place where it happens to be polluted and, and not really supporting aerobic activity? We've gone over the wind currents. We've gone over timing it properly to where literally spacing out workouts and also running out, running at the, a specific time of day that will support having a healthy workout. I have one more, and no, it is not scrap the workout because that wouldn't be a very good like running video or how to run in a 
polluted environment video if I was like, well, just don't run for a day. And it's like, this is like in a situation where you feel like, you physically feel like you've got to go for a run and you're willing to make the sacrifices, but you just want to do it in the best way possible at the time, right? Maybe you're traveling to a city or you're there for a couple of weeks or whatever it might be. You could obviously do like, like a swim or an aqua run or do something on the treadmill. Uh, which I did a few days ago. Uh, this is how to make an outdoor polluted run better or as healthy as possible. So with that, my third suggestion. I'm just kidding. You could wear a mask while you run. And obviously, you know, I kind of look like Bane from Batman, which is cool. No one cared who I was till I put on the mask. Some people can go for the more stylish masks where there's like, you can get like patterns or like a face or whatever to make your, your pollution protection like kind of like a chic thing. Anything like this will protect you from PM 2.5. I think you want to look for the runs, the ones that are rated N95 or higher because those will filter out the fine particulate matter that we were talking about. But these will have like a little breathy thing maybe, like with like a filter in it. Or it could just be like a simple cloth one. This is this is a nicer one that cost me almost seven euros, I think. And it's even got like an adjustable thing here. here. Make sure you get one that's big enough for your face. Um, this one's just a bit too small. It has to cover everything and there needs to be a seal. It has to be like pretty finely sealed on the nose because it's starting, you're trying to filter air. But this will help, this will, this will actually, this will, work wonders. I remember when I was in Beijing last time, a few years ago, it was here during the summer, um, and the pollution was still bad. It was still like 200, even though it was summertime. And sometimes, you know, I finished my, my little intensive Chinese class and I, I had to just go move and do something because I, I would have gone crazy just like not using my body basically. And so, I would, you know, at the end of the day, four or 5 p.m. and I throw on a mask and it would be kind of, you know, obviously a little obnoxious, and it would get a little hot and sweaty underneath, but you don't smell the pollution, you don't taste it. it there's a clear difference between when you put it on and when you, and you breathe and you take it off and you breathe. And so I would do that. I really wouldn't take it off. It'd be really frustrating sometimes because having something on your face, like literally inhibiting your breathing a little bit is really not, if you're like me when you go running, it's kind of like you want to be free and like just go out and do whatever. And it's have like this kind of like, like no restrictions, no, no boundary, no, um, nothing limiting you kind of feeling. You're just running, literally just moving your body and running around. And a mask is kind of a weird thing to have on your face. Um, but um, that's what I would say. So, you know, if, if you find yourself stuck in a polluted environment for a few days, buy a mask, they're pretty cheap. And that'll, that should give you some peace of mind. It'll, it'll reduce, it'll reduce the, effect a little bit, I think, you know? All I can see what the science says about wearing a mask and like how, how much it actually helps reduce the, the emissions in your body. All right, so I went into a bit of a rabbit hole looking for the effects of masks uh, on reducing pollution. The short version is that, yes, they can reduce up to about 80% of fine particulates if you get the right type of mask. So actually the mask I was wearing in the video is not the correct type of mask to do this. So what is the correct type? Well, there's two things to consider when you're buying a mask. Uh, the first thing is, is uh, well, obviously does it filter the fine particulates, the bad stuff, right? The second is the breathability so that your breathing isn't restricted when you're trying to breathe through the mask. So, hmm, interesting. How can it filter the fine particulates but still let you breathe oxygen um, easy? Easily. And so if those are the two considerations, uh, what I found was a uh, mask you made using nanotechnology, specifically nanofiber made from electric spinning, whatever that is. And it's also in a cone shape. So I linked one or two of them below. And just so you guys know, I'm not affiliated with uh, these companies at all whatsoever. I just kind of found them. And like I was saying earlier, the mask in the Beijing video was not the best mask to be using. The one I was using maybe, maybe filtered 30% of the bad stuff which is still better than zero, right? Uh, a multi-layer nanofiber mask like the one I just described can filter out about 80% of the spinned fine particulates. And even one smaller than 0 0.3 microns. Mm, isn't that nice? The reason it can only filter out about 30% is because the porosity was too big or basically the, the, the way the mask is made, like the fibers were too wide in like the traditional cloth mask. It's too wide to, to cover all the, to catch all the bad stuff. The nanofiber, it's, it's woven more tightly and also in such a way to where it catches the bad stuff, but it's still, so Somehow allows oxygen to pass more readily through the mask. And of course, I'll link to all this research below. And of course, I'll link to the, the mask and the research behind the masks as well below. 
Thanks. All right, so I actually have to catch a flight. I'm going back to back to Europe where they say polluted is something where it's like 30. <laughs> I remember in Paris, people are like, oh my God, it's like 40 today. They have to, I think in Paris actually they reduce, they do the car limiting thing. If it gets to be around like 50, then they'll actually like limit the, the license plate. They'll have like, oh, if, you, if your license plate ends in an odd number, you can't drive on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday or something. They'll, they'll flip it like that to reduce the amount of cars on the road at 50. Ah! All right, so hopefully this is helpful to anybody who's, who lives in a polluted place, who's traveling to a polluted place, um, who's worried, you know, if you're like one of what the health effects are as an athlete. The last thing I could say is, you know, as, as a runner, I've been running for like 15 years and I've lived in these places that I was describing. Sometimes you just find ways to make it work. And honestly, a lot of times I would mentally just accept that for a little while, it would be probably not the best for my body. But I, and so I would go running, I would do it anyways when I, probably could have put, could have or should have been staying inside. I also knew that I wouldn't be living in a heavily polluted area for a long period of time, like 20 years or something. That's not something I'm willing, that is not a sacrifice I'm willing to make. For a couple of years, sure, just to kind of go to a different place and have a different lifestyle um, and see what it's like in another country, another part of the world. But for me, my health, my performance, long-term is, is a massive priority for me. And so I'll make those kind of long-term decisions about let's say putting myself in a country or in a place to where um, health and fitness and activity and sport are kind of like, just kind of championed and supported. And I have like a like-minded community around me and stuff. Not every city in the US is like that. Not every city in Europe is like that. Not every city in Asia is like that, but there's some really good places for that. Like um, for example, San Diego, California has a really active fit city, fit population, beautiful training weather, beautiful climate, very little pollution. And so that's a place to live long-term kind of deal, you know? Paris may not be a place to live 20 years as a, as a as a runner attempting to be a great and amazing runner, you know? Because it's not necessarily the perfect climate, either environmentally or athletically for that. Um, Paris isn't exactly known for its distance running scene. All right, guys, I'm uh, about to catch a flight back to, right there, flight back to Europe, uh, which will be fantastic. And I hope that now in the future, going forward, you guys can make more educated decisions about your athletics and kind of environmental pollution and stuff um, in the context of being in, in Asia. And yeah, so now you guys have some ideas on kind of like how to maneuver around it, but then you also know like, what the, the effects are of doing it. And so if you choose to go suffer those health effects, you, you do so knowingly instead of unknowingly. Because as they say, knowledge is power. All right, see you guys, bye.